Hello there, my fellow revilers of the Imperial Truth, and welcome back to another Warhammer 40k lore video. Surprise, everyone! Today we're actually starting a brand new mini-series of lore, which is gonna be part of the grander Forces of Chaos topic. For a pretty long time now, some of my viewers have asked me if I was ever gonna start talking about the so-called Lost and the Damned. Now, this is actually a pretty generic term for the Forces of Chaos overall, but there are elements of it that I haven't talked about yet. And the most notable of these are the actual cults and cultists of Chaos. In the past, we did overview actual demons, demon lords, demon engines, elite units of the ruinous powers, but we never actually talked about the base element of it all. Which is, like most things in civilized societies, the regular and lowly humans. This mini-series will spread across several episodes, and today we shall start with the ancient days of the Horus Heresy, when these things actually got started. I also apologize if I'm gonna make references to things I have talked about before, but most of you already know that I do like my episodes to be at least partially self-contained. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? When the Age of Darkness inaugurated by the Horus Heresy descended upon the Imperium of Man, the galaxy reeled in shock that the Emperor's greatest champions, the Primarchs and their Astarte sons, would seek to tear down all they had built during the Great Crusade. The Legionis Astartes were created to be the very best of mankind, the champions and protectors of an entire race, the stalwart defenders against the unnameable horrors that had brought humanity to the brink of destruction during the bleak millennia of old night. If the likes of Horus, Fulgrim, or Lorgar could be corrupted under the baleful influence of the powers of the Warb, then what hope remained for the teeming masses of humanity that they would do otherwise? As the Horus Heresy entered its second year and the fires of war swept across the Imperium, the true and horrific extent of the traitor's sins were exposed. The earliest of battles had revealed the War Master to have turned numerous august bodies to his cause, including those within the Mechanicum Tagmata and the Legio Titanicus, as well as innumerable Exertus Imperialis auxilia units. At Calf, however, a new element of the traitor's blasphemy was employed. Vast hosts swore to serve the traitor Legionis Astartes, devoted to them not only in body, but in soul. These deluded so-called warp cultists were named so because of their mindless veneration of the creatures that dwell in the Imperion, and of their fallen Legionis Astartes masters. The Warp Cults had of course been encountered, albeit infrequently, during the progress of the Great Crusade. Such debased examples of humanity were usually found on worlds within proximity to existing Warp Storm activity, or with a prevalence of Psyker births within the general population. Such cults were oftentimes tainted with interaction with Xeno's lore or contamination by alien races or promulgated by some alpha-level rogue psyker with messianic or apocalyptic inclinations. Direct confrontations with such threats were however rare, as they were either a relatively minor factor in a large compliance campaign, or encountered in very unusual circumstances. One example was the lengthy persecution of the Voidborn Gephora Warp Witches by the Night Lord Legion, across the Veomir reaches. The principal reason for this was that since the very beginning of the Great Crusade, any world encountered with substantial warp breaches, in evidence of the kind that such cults either promulgated, or were often spawned from, were simply destroyed via exterminatus without any direct confrontation. This order had been a direct and unwavering dictate issued directly by the Emperor and one which had been upheld without exception until the word-bearers themselves began to covertly subvert and ignore it for their own ends. As to the, air tags, truth of such veneration, it was considered no more than just another false religion among hundreds of others. It was meaningless in the context of the imperial truth, and consigned to the darkness from which the Great Crusade was delivering the galaxy, or so it was believed at the time. 
The truth, however, was that on many fringe and backwater worlds declared compliant by Horus's supporters, entire populations had not only been allowed to shed the mask of civilization and reason and surrender themselves to the warp, but actively encouraged to do so by the work of the word bearers and other hidden forces. As the insanity of galactic civil war was gripping the Imperium, Previously, law-abiding peoples rose up against their masters, slaughtering those in authority in bloody displays of long-repressed hatred. Once productive workers smashed the machines they had tended for generations and set Manufactoria aflame. Among this madness, educated men and women cast off their secular reason they had been born into and resurrected the hidden idolatries of their ancestors. Of the seeds of this galaxy-wide chaos, much has been surmised but very little proven. Indeed, it is likely that warp cults, which originally aligned themselves to the Warmaster Horus's cause, did so for a wide range of reasons. However, the end result was essentially the same. Anarchy, treachery, and bloodshed on a galactic scale. Regardless of the underlying source of the taint, it was the dark genius of the Warmaster's numerous envoys, in particular the Wordbearer's dark apostles and their disciples, which harnessed it to the traitor's cause. No doubt, most of them would have actually receded over the generations, were it not for the far-reaching and horrific schemes of first asshole Erebus and his minions, while others would have likely burned themselves out in brief bloody rebellions. One source of the corruption which led to the formation of many warp cults was the religious leaning of many ancestor populations, suggesting woeful failure of the iterators whose task was it to dispel these beliefs and replace them with the imperial truth. Indeed, no world should have been declared actually fully compliant until this occurred, hinting at either conspiracy or a monumental scale of gross incompetence. The latter might seem the most plausible theory, but the events of the Horus heresy indicate that the former is all too possible as well. Regardless, in the aftermath of the Istvan V betrayal, countless thousands of formerly denounced religions reawakened in a subtly altered form. Benevolent deities were supplanted by vengeful gods, and offerings of crops replaced by demands of blood sacrifice. All of this led inexorably to the worship of those powers which came so close to laying the Imperium low. Another source lay in humanity's own dark nature. Despite the trappings of civilization and the appointment of Imperial commanders to rule over them, the populations of a great many worlds still existed in barbarous conditions, little improved since the Age of Strife. A campaign to bring a primitive feral world into Imperial compliance might be won in just a couple of weeks, but it might take decades or even centuries before such a world would support a functional society able to take its place in the Imperium. The populations of these worlds were notoriously warlike and primitive. It took many generations to educate them in the Imperial truth for the native ancestral superstitions were never far below the surface of those recently illuminated by the Emperor's light. Similarly, large parts of the populations of many hive worlds were violently lawless and resentful of any kind of authority. Even the most productive of hive worlds were host to countless thousands of wretches who existed in the lightless underhive depths who had never learned about the Imperial truth. On worlds like Gamma Horgan or Kado, hyper-violent underhive gangers were quick to join with the forces of disorder when the Horus heresy came knocking. Ironically, they began hailing the Warmaster as a leader truly deserving of their loyalty. At the other end of the spectrum were highly ranked individuals whose positions of power in the upper echelons of Imperial expedition fleets granted them access to knowledge others were denied. Though many aberrant human cultures were entirely obliterated, conservators attached to the Great Crusade fleets strove to record tales of the defeated foes of humanity, from ravening alien horrors to arrogant human societies. Much of this knowledge was locked away securely and remained accessible only to the most senior of human and transhuman leaders. That's because many accounts contradicted the atheistic doctrines of the imperial truth and could not be allowed to fall into the hands of the weak, the malevolent, or the ignorant. Inevitably, however, some did, 
and many senior conservators were compromised by the events they recounted, or the accounts in their custody. Men and women who had dedicated their entire lives to proving primitive superstitions false, discovered that their own beliefs in empiricism and rationality were in fact the actual lies. When the Age of Darkness fell, the knowledge washed over by many conservators escaped into the hands of the madmen and the traitors, who, in their turn, preached it to the warp-slaved multitudes. The events that unfolded at the Battle of Calf would reveal a far more concerted effort to cultivate false beliefs, in direct contradiction to the Imperial Truth, in preparation for the galaxy-wide uprising that erupted in the aftermath of Istvan. It would be many years until the horrifying extent was realized, but it is now evident that the 17th Legionis Astartes, the Bible-thumping word-bearers, were the main culprits. They deliberately seeded countless hidden warp cults across the worlds they had brought into compliance, over five decades prior to the outbreak of the Horus Heresy. These were referred to by the sons of Lorgar and by many of the cults themselves as the Holy Worlds, and beneath the mask of imperial compliance, they hid a myriad of aberrant doctrines. Worlds that on the surface appeared civilized and ordered, were in fact seething with heresy. Furthermore, they would attract the outcast and the dispossessed, those unable or unwilling to accept the imperial truth. Individually or in small groups, hidden pilgrims traveled from all over the Imperium to join these bodies. They would swell their numbers to such an extent that, when the word was given, billions of them rose up as one and declared the War Master as their Lord, or in some cases, even their God. At the time of the Battle of Calf, very few among the Imperium's rulers were conscious of what the numerous warp cults actually believed. Later, they would become all too aware. And much later still, all such knowledge would be suppressed and declared anathema by the High Lords of Terra and the Holy Inquisition. At the early stage, however, it was guessed that the cults worshipped what they imagined to be deities within the otherworldly dimension of the warp. Certainly, navigators and astropaths, and perhaps even the Primarchs, were aware that the Empyrean was host to an order of life that had no analog in the material universe. However, this mysterious realm was still able to interact with it in a limited fashion, in particular through those who had been born with psychic abilities. Investigations, interrogations, and signal interceptions revealed a myriad occult terms in use among the warp cults, many of them beyond classification, but there remained a few terms and precepts that appeared over and over again. The Primordial Annihilator was one such term, a title determined to refer to the warp itself, as if the Empyrean was some kind of vast gestalt consciousness that the warp cults appear to venerate. Others refer to the Octad and the Eightfold Path, ascribing an unfathomable formulae and a dark purpose to the entities they believed guided their actions. They also, for some reason, really love the number eight. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the birth, so to speak, of the Chaos Cult during the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. Quite a complex topic to talk about, in my opinion, since one of the main questions it births should be, what could have been done to prevent their appearance? The answer to that is definitely not simple, and likely deserves its own video. But to summarize it for now, in my opinion, I don't think it could have been entirely stopped. What are your thoughts on the genesis of worshipping the ruinous powers and the birth of the Chaos Cults? Let us all know what you think in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects